All right, what's up everybody? This is Ryan here, and you are watching episode 77 of my live stream Q&A. So, um, I thought what I would do today is I would try to tackle a topic which is pretty difficult to explain. And I think one of the main reasons why it's such a particularly difficult thing to explain is that when you actually get into the source code of what's going on here, it is a little bit complicated. And on because it's so complicated underneath things, yet in many ways the, the API over top of that is quite simple, it kind of lends the whole idea of Kotlin coroutines, or I guess coroutines in general, as being quite magical and mysterious and difficult to understand. So what I thought I would do today is, uh, so I plan on revisiting this topic eventually, but I wanted to basically give you um, a rough version of, say, a lecture introducing coroutines. So not just kind of what they are conceptually, but also how to actually use them in an Android application, practically speaking which is, uh, those are kind of two different topics immediately. So what I thought I would do is, uh, so I'm going to give, I, I don't know how long this lecture will end up. Uh, preferably, I'm going to try and keep it to 20 minutes, but I could end up talking for as long as 40 minutes. I will try to stay on task here, but there's just so much going on, and anyone who's watched my show with any regularity uh, knows that I tend to go on some tangents. Now, I don't go on tangents just to piss you off or something like that. It's usually, I think, useful information, but just, just be aware that I'm going to be basically giving the lesson for maybe 20 to 30 minutes. I won't be able to look at the chat while that's going on because I just have too many windows go open. I've got my OBS Studio window open. I'll have my notes going, and then I'll have my uh, as you'll see some code going on on my main monitor, so there's just, I can't look at comments at the same time and do that, but feel free to ask uh, questions about it and mention your comments, and that's totally cool. So, uh, yeah, what we'll do first is we'll basically just jump into the uh, explanation here, uh, then I'll have a quick coffee break, and then we'll get to some regular Q&A. So, um, one of the things, so just before I get into this, just understand this is like a rough version of a talk. This is like an early draft. So one of the problems about it is I didn't have time to create really good visual graphics uh, in order to actually teach you what coroutines are conceptually. And I find uh, when you're introducing something to a new topic it and they're not familiar with the code per se, it's really useful to to have visual graphics. The best I could do for today was to just write some stuff on the note, the uh, whiteboard over here. And what I'll do is I'll try and talk about it and go over it. And hopefully that will end up being useful. So uh, yeah, like I say, try to be patient with me on this one or not. I don't really care, but uh, it's going to be a little bit rough, but I think it's got some decent information. So just give me one moment to uh, organize my notes and then we'll get started. Uh. All right. So, uh, just starting from the beginning. Sorry, one moment. I didn't do that properly. It's always tricky because I have to basically juggle, juggle like 16 different windows in order to do this properly. Okay, yeah, there we go. I can make OBS Studio a little smaller. Ah, shit. Oi, Blin. Okay. I can't even see half my other monitor. Oh, holy crap. And of course my notes doesn't have word wrap on, so I gotta turn that on. Wrap to window, there we go. All right, we are ready to go for explaining Kotlin coroutines. And what is up, Mr. Grohick? Okay, so here we go. So how do how are we gonna do this? What, what's, what's going on? I don't know, I, I don't know what I'm talking about here. Okay, so let's talk about coroutines on Kotlin. 
so before I get to like the actual lesson part, why why should you care about Kotlin coroutines? So uh, I've been programming in Java uh, for well over yeah over four or five years at this point, and I've been coding in Kotlin for about a year and a half. And uh, I've been, of course, most of my time is spent on Android. So when I was working with Java and Android, I ran into this library, which became super popular, called RxJava. And RxJava was basically, the way I like to describe it, was like the observer pattern on steroids. If that doesn't make any sense to you, don't worry about it. You don't need to understand that. But these topics are kind of related. And so... In, in a nutshell, what exactly is the observer pattern? It's a situation where either different objects or even different functions can basically communicate with each other without having to, uh, by knowing about each other in sort of an indirect way. And that's one of the themes that we're going to see popping up with coroutines. Why do we use it though? We basically use it when we have a situation where instead of our program being able to just run line by line sequentially through all of the instructions of a program, oftentimes we have situations where the execution of the program isn't line by line it or uh, one after another in terms of like time. It's indeterminate or asynchronous. So this is kind of the main point with uh, coroutines here is asynchrony or asynchronous programming or concurrency you might have heard the word um, we have a computer and it's capable of dividing workload execution of code into separate threads separate processes separate coroutines for example it can divide things and these different things can do their work at the same time and then call back at an indeterminate time so this is kind of one of the core problems that coroutines looks to solve. And what I'll do is now we'll start to get into some of the specifics of coroutines. So the first thing I wanted to talk about, and so right off the bat, this is one part of this talk that I'm really not happy with uh, without good visual diagrams. So the next best thing I can do for you is I can take you through some of the actual source code of coroutines and I can kind of point to some general things on the whiteboard here which might help you but in the future I expect a much more polished uh, presentation in that regard. So conceptually what is a coroutine? So what I wanted to start people off with was I'm, I'm gonna go all like WWE style holding the microphone here. <laughs> okay so conceptually speaking what is it what exactly is a it is a coroutine? So in terms of if we want to, let's just play word games for a little bit, because at first I was wondering, what does this word coroutine actually mean, even outside of the context of, of programming? So one of the ways we can think about this is uh, basically, if I were to pick a different name, and I'm not saying you should use this name for a coroutine, it's like a cooperating function. So it, it's just a function, but somehow it's able to cooperate with other functions. Coroutine, co-function. So when I say that to you, that doesn't really help you that much. It probably just gives you more questions than answers. In fact, the key question that that will probably give you is um, how can it communicate with other functions? How does that work? Are we talking about maybe inter-thread communication, inter-process communication? Not exactly. We can do threading with coroutines, but it's something a little bit different with that. And in order, in order to actually explain this, what I'll have to do is I'll have to show you some of the source code and kind of go through it with you. So let me just take a long sip of coffee and then we'll get started here. Okay, hopefully that is audible enough. Okay, so the first theme we're going to look at here is that um, we're going to look at some of the different 
properties of a coroutine, but the first thing we're going to do code-wise is we're just going to have a look at a quick example. Okay, so this is just something I wrote in a Kotlin Android Studio project. It's this uh, class here called coroutines demo. All it has is a suspending function, which is just a normal function, just a normal function, nothing fancy going on, and then we slap on the suspend modifier. Ooh, spooky, magical. What does this actually do? Well, what we're going to do, so one of the nifty features, and this is seriously one of the best ways to learn Kotlin, is in Android Studio, you can go up to, is it, uh, tools, here we go, I momentarily forgot. And in the tools window, depending on what version of Android Studio you're working with, there is this Kotlin option down here, and then at the bottom we have Show Kotlin Bytecode. So I've already clicked that, and on the side here we have this Kotlin Bytecode window. Now, I'm you know I'm familiar with the very basics of reading bytecode, but uh, we're we're not going to do that. What we're actually going to do is we're going to hit this decompile button here, and so this is actually going to basically show you what happens so I forgot to add the suspend keyword that would have been silly so so we've got our Kotlin code and then we see what it looks like when it's converted to JVM sort of bytecode and then we can like sort of decompile reverse that process back into Java now the reason why this helps us a lot of times is that we actually kinda of get to see what's going on under the hood at least on the J JVM, so this whole talk is talking about coroutines on the JVM, just so you're aware, um, we can actually kind of see what's going on. So this thing doesn't look like it's updated properly, so let, let me just see, there we go. So I'm gonna hit decompile, and that's what I'm looking for. Okay, so as I just mentioned, so we've got just some stupid old function that doesn't do anything. Then we slap on this suspend keyword, and what does that actually do? How do we actually create a coroutine out of this? All that suspend keyword does is it adds this continuation object. A continuation. Let me go ahead and just delete that, and then we'll decompile it again. And notice that basically all that's happened is we no longer have a continuation object. So this is kind of the first entry point that we need to get into because this is really important. So earlier I said that coroutines are like functions that can cooperate together, cooperating functions, co-functions. And a couple of specific points here. Is that they can be nested Coroutines can be nested, they can be suspended, they can be cancelled, and they can be threaded if you want. And all of this is made possible just by adding this continuation object. So what the hell is a continuation? So this is where we'll jump to next. So what I'm going to do now is we're going to look at the actual source code for Kotlin coroutines. So this repository is called kotlinx.coroutines and you can check it out. I basically just cloned it. Okay, so let me just find my place in my notes. And so the first thing I want to do is I want to look at this continuation object. So just bear in mind when we added the suspending keyword to our stupid little function here, it added a continuation object to that function, and it didn't actually really do much other than that. Just added the continuation. So what's a continuation? So mind you, the actual implementation details and stuff like that is uh, elsewhere, but this is basically just, oops, this is, what, oh, sorry, random messages from Android Studio. So this is what, the continuation object looks like as an interface. So all I want you to pay attention to is it has this resume function. So when we want to figure out a class, what it is, when we want to figure out what a class is, my tip to you is to look at the source code and ask yourself two questions. What does it have? What objects does it possess? And what does it do? What 
functions does it have? And the really the thing that's jumping out here is we have this resume with. So we're creating a function and we're giving it a continuation object and this continuation object can resume operations. So it can be paused and it can resume. So that's one of the key points here about why we're using this word suspend in when we're talking about coroutines. It's a function that can suspend and this continuation object is basically the main way that it does that. It can be suspended. That's useful. This is basically like a callback. Okay, so that's relatively simple and I'm, I'm not going to go into too much detail. This is just like a generic result wrapper and we, we don't want to actually take this particular uh, thing seriously because it's actually kind of a stub. <laughs> but this will give you a general idea of this continuation object. Now this part is simple. So we have a continuation object and what it does is it's, it, it can resume. What does it have? And this is where things get complicated, so I'm just going to let the, the beginners know in particular, if you don't understand what the hell I'm talking about um, in detail, that's totally okay, because this there's a lot of moving parts going on here. So now we have, our, we have a coroutine context object, so just be aware of that, just jumping back here. We add our suspend keyword to some regular old function. It adds a continuation object, and when we, oops, that's not what I wanted, when we actually look, why is my Android Studio not behaving? There we go. When we actually look at the continuation object, it's, it's pretty simple. Coroutine context, which we'll look at next, unfortunately is not so simple, but it's really cool. Um, coroutine context is where a lot of the magic happens. There is no magic, but there kind of is some magic, and it... It can be understood, but it's it's a little tricky. So just give me one moment to uh, have a cup of water. Okay, so let's have a look at coroutine context. So whenever we're talking about coroutines, we're basically also talking about something called a coroutine context. So we won't go into a ton of detail about this particular thing, but the, the, the thing that I do want you to know about coroutine context, and this is the important detail here, is that it's basically, um, it's, it's an indexed set of element in instances. It's like a uh, mix between a set and a map. To simplify things, let's just consider that coroutine context is like a map. So when I say map, I mean like the, hopefully you're familiar with the map API from collections in Kotlin and Java. So a map is full of elements and you can find each element in the map with a key. So we've got key value type stuff going on. Uh, put things in with a, a key to find it and then the data and that's kind of, hopefully you know how a map works. Okay, so this thing is basically a map. Now, what I wanted to, let me just make sure I'm not jumping around here. So what I wanted to point out here, so I said this is where the magic happens. So, so what exactly is magical, magical about this coroutine context? So let's look at what the actual elements. So here we just see like pretty generic kind of functions to add things to a map type stuff going on. But the thing I want you to pay attention to is we have this interface down here, element, and we use this a lot in coroutine context. Now, wait a minute, element extends coroutine context. Wait a minute. So we have a map which is capable of nesting other maps inside of themselves. So again, just to, to reiterate here, earlier I said that coroutines can be nested. That's interesting. That's actually pretty magical. Okay. Okay, so we have this map 
this coroutine context thing, and it can contain ele elements, and it can contain other coroutine contexts. So the next thing we want to do is uh, let's just have, let me double check where I am in my notes here. So the next thing I wanted to mention, so uh, the, the takeaway here is just understand that we have this nesting behavior that can be achieved with coroutines, and we'll see an example of that shortly. And part of how it achieves that is through this coroutine context object being a map, which can possess other coroutine contexts. Okay, that's probably whatever, lots of jargon there. What else can a coroutine context contain? Several different things, but again, one of the things I mentioned up on the whiteboard, coroutines can be cancelled. How do we cancel a coroutine? Well, what we can do is we have another thing called a job. I don't have a job personally, but uh, this API has a job. <laughs> um, we have this job interface. And lo and behold, what does it extend? Coroutine context dot element. We can add a job to a coroutine context. So the important takeaway here for this job is is that it has several different states. So it's a, a way of like maintaining information about what's going on in a particular coroutine context or a particular coroutine in general. But it also can be canceled. And this is where we get our cancellation functionality, and we'll see that in an example later. So that's kind of the, the general anatomy of a coroutine, leaving out coroutine scope, which we'll look at in a minute. So the, the purpose in explaining that is that, um, just to reiterate what I just went over, so when we want to think about what a, a coroutine is conceptually, it can be really difficult because we'll hear people say things like a coroutine is a function that can be nested, suspended, cancelled, threaded, even if you want to, and we'll see threading in a minute as well. It's just a function with these extra things. And what that really means is that starting with what I showed you right in the beginning, it all starts with just adding this suspend keyword to some function. That kind of basically turns it into like a cooperating function or a coroutine. And how does it actually do the cooperation? How does it actually do the suspending? How does it wait for some other thing to happen? How does it uh, cancel? How do you nest coroutines within each other? We had the suspend keyword as one example. That gives us this continuation object. Okay, cool. Continuation looks like this. It can resume. So this is where we're, we get kind of our suspending behavior. And then it also has a coroutine context. Then if we jump into coroutine context, it's basically like a map. And it the elements of this coroutine context uh, actually extend coroutine context so that we can actually nest these maps into each other. And that's kind of another layer of cooperation that we get. And then there's more things going on. There's jobs, there's, there's scopes, um, that kind of stuff, dispatchers. There's a lot of topics going on here. But then we get this job object, which extends coroutine context element. And you can add that into a coroutine context. So that's basically it for the kind of theory conceptual part of this uh, little discussion. Uh, I see that's only taken me like uh, we'll say like 20 minutes to get through, so I'm pretty proud of myself there. But wait, there's more. So what I just explained to you was hopefully like a half-decent conceptual uh, explanation of coroutines. I wish I had better, I'll, I'll make better visual graphics and I'll polish this lecture more as time goes by. This is just like a rough version. The second part we're going to talk about is the, the practical uh, things we need to do to get coroutines working in our Android applications. This can also extend to other platforms, but I'm going to assume you're an Android developer. Um, but like I say, there's some general generalities here that we can apply. So I talked about 
all those different things. I talked about uh, suspending functions. I talked about a continuation. I talked about coroutine context. I talked about job. There's another thing which I really need to talk about, which you need to know about with coroutines, and that is a coroutine scope. So that's what we have on this side of my horrendous, horrendously drawn whiteboard samples. So um, I'm not even really going to waste much time trying to explain conceptually what a coroutine scope is. Um, because it would be tricky, but I'm going to kind of roundabout explain kind of what we need to do and how it works. So, practically speaking, as I said before, we can nest coroutines within, within each other. So we can say, for example, in some root object, like a, an activity, like a view model, like a presenter, like a controller, we can start up some coroutines in this root object, and then we can call suspending functions. And those suspending functions, through the magic of the coroutine context and all the stuff I talked about earlier, can basically be nested within one another. So when we think of this word scope, we have like a, a, a circle which is like the, the root coroutine and then everything that's nested inside of it and it's all scoped so when I think of this word scoped if you're wondering it, it's like a way of um, this is, it's a hard word to explain which is why I didn't really bother earlier and here I am trying to explain what it means but uh, it's like a think of it like a container uh, for the nested coroutines the nested units of work the event stream one event stream with one coroutine scope kind of swallowing it all up. Okay, so how do we set up this coroutine scope and what, where should we set it up? And that's kind of one of the keys here. So when you're deciding, and I'll show you what this actually looks like in code in a moment, when you're deciding where to place your which object or even a function, it could apply to a function, but I'll just assume we're doing object-oriented programming here. Um, which object should extend or become a coroutine scope. Generally speaking, the object should have a life cycle. Why? Let's say, for example, we make a view model as our coroutine scope. Or actually, let's take a different example. Let's do model view presenter. We have a presenter uh, that is made as a coroutine scope for a particular feature of the application, and then the user navigates to a different feature of the application. Because we have that scope, and the root object in this example I'm mentioning is a presenter, we can cancel all of that work when the user navigates away from the uh, current feature. Okay, so that's kind of why we need something. It helps to have something that either has a life cycle or has some kind of way of knowing what the current life cycle is. So this scribble up here says life cycle. Okay, what's the other thing we need to worry about? A scope can be run on a particular thread. When it comes to Android, almost invariably your, your root object, your root scope, should be on the main thread, the UI thread. You're going to be able to jump off of the UI thread really easily. I'll show you how to do that. You just use this uh, with context thing. You're going to be able to jump off the main thread when you need to, but you want basically everything to call back to your main thread because ultimately that's you're going to be probably rendering something on the user interface. Obviously there's some situations if you're not dealing with the UI at all, maybe you don't have to be on the, maybe you want to be on the main thread, but in any case, generally speaking, what I'm saying here is, and we'll see this in a minute, whatever is your root object, your, it could be an activity. If you don't have any kind of architecture, you could make your activity a friggin' coroutine scope. I don't suggest it, but you can make your view model, your presenter, controller, whatever, your servlet maybe, if you're in a Java E. Okay, so it's on the main thread, and we'll see how to do that. 
And the last point here is we want to kind of conceptually think of our root object as like our entry point into concurrency, our entry point into the asynchronous operations. So some class, like a UI class, maybe will say to our root object, which could be a view model, hey, some button was clicked, and then all of a sudden, that's when we need to start the coroutines magic going. That's when we need to worry about asynchronous operations going on. Okay, so that's kind of the general points here. The last thing I just wanted to point out, and we'll see this really quickly in demo, is uh, what you're going to be doing is we have our root object, and then let's say we have like multiple different classes to get our work done. So maybe we have like our view model, and then we have our repository, and then we have our room database. Okay? Each of those, each of the functions we call, the subsequent functions, are going to be suspending functions. They're going to have the suspend modifier, and that allows us to keep everything nested and in our scope, cancelable. And then, if we have a situation where we need to jump to, say, the I.O. thread, we still make it a suspending function, so this is like our room database here, and then we use the with context coroutine builder, and we give the with context coroutine builder dispatchers.io. This is how we say do this on the I.O. thread. Okay, so that's a verbal explanation. The last thing we'll do, and I realize this is a very long lesson, but hopefully this is useful information for you, is we're going to run through a quick example of like an end-to-end, -end, basically an end-to-end -end example in an Android app of what I literally just explained to you, and the code is open source. So, uh, if you've enjoyed the show so far, please do me a favor and hit the like button down below. I'm just going to take a quick coffee, and then we'll get started with that. Okay, so I'm going to open up Kotlin Notes MVVM, or Jetpack Notes MVVM Kotlin, link in the description box below, and okay, so what are we going to do here? So let's go step by step through what I just told you. So step number one, all of my view models, all of them, extend base view model which is a class I created here, which extends view model from Android architecture components, but that's not important. But it also, our base view model, is given a UI context object, or sorry, possesses a UI context object as a property, and it extends coroutine scope. So this is what I was talking about before. We have some kind of object which uh, has a life cycle or at least plays nicely with your Android life cycle. And base view model is a great example. And uh, we make it a coroutine scope. When we do that, if I just kind of delete this here, when we do that, we basically have to override some kind of coroutine context. And just notice that we're adding the UI context here. So that's the part I was talking about where we specify main thread. We set our coroutine scope up on the main thread. Okay, so I'm just going to add that back in. And also notice that this root thing, this root scope, whatever you want to call it, um, also has this job tracker object. Now, there's actually an easier way to build this thing, but what is this job tracker? Up here, I create it. It's just a job. Get a job. <laughs> and uh, this is what allows for our cancellation. This job, basically, if we, within this, whatever view model extends base view model, we can basically say to this thing, hey, cancel what you're doing and it'll cancel everything in the, the coroutine scope. Okay, so that's step number one. Now let's look at a particular view model. Now this view model extends base view model, so just understand that's what's going on here. Then we're going to look at get note, the get note function. So the get note function is fired 
when the view at some point publishes an event to this view model and says, hey, on start has happened. So we go to the get, get note function and we give it uh, a note ID from the event, um, which could be blank or it could be the actual ID of a note. Just don't worry about those details. It's not actually that important. And then what we do is we, we ask this object called, uh, no, sorry, I, I jumped ahead a little bit, just understand. So we, we've got our, our root coroutine scope. Once we set that up, from our function, this is where we jump into coroutines land. We make that function, the first one that gets called when we want to start working asynchronously, we, we give this function a, a launch coroutine builder. You can do other things, you can use async. Um, for most people learning, I, launches, I think a little conceptually, might be a bit easier to work with. Uh, well, maybe it depends. I, I guess it depends on what you prefer. But just understand we're using this launch coroutine builder. So everything that is within our launch builder here can be considered to be part of our suspending function, essentially. What does that actually mean? What does this thing actually do? By wrapping this code in our launch block, we can have asynchronous functions. Sorry, I'm in full screen mode. By wrapping this launch object in our, wrapping our function in this launch object, we're entering coroutines land, and then we can call suspending functions other coroutines, we can nest other coroutines in our kind of main scope that we've got going on. Now, a particular feature of the launch coroutine builder is that whatever exists within this block operates synchronously. It goes line by line. However, it doesn't block the thread it's on. This can confuse some people here. We're not threading, we're on basically the same thread essentially, except this thing is not blocking the whole thread. Or it doesn't have to. So here is our one of our asynchronous operations here. We have note repo. Let's assume the user clicked on a particular note and note ID is not just empty. And then we need to get that note from our backend repository. So we call our backend function. So this is basically where we go from our root object down to our suspending function. Okay, let's look at note repo dot get note ID. So uh, note repo, I'll just show you really quickly. This is an interface, and notice how these interface functions are suspend functions. So once we enter coroutines lan land by way of a launch coroutine builder or other coroutine builders, now we need to start using our suspending functions. And that way we can nest them and that's how all the magic really happens here. So let's look at what actually implements this repository. Firebase note repo impl. And specifically we'll look at this get, uh, get note by id function here. So we've got our suspend function. Cool. Uh, everyone's totally happy. And then we pass in our note ID here. That's totally fine. And then we say return if active user. So we're going to either return get remote notes or get local notes. Okay. An active user, just understand all we're doing here is we're checking is a user currently logged in. If a user is not currently logged in, then we want to get notes from the local on device database. Otherwise, if the user is logged in, then we want to get it from the Firebase database. So just notice in this particular thing, we have a Firebase auth object to check if the user exists. We've got a remote Firestore, which is our remote database. And then we've got a note DAO, which is from Room, which is our local database. So let's assume the user is offline. So we jump to get local note by the ID. I'm just going to kill this Kotlin bytecode thing here. Here we go. So we go to get, where is it? Uh, get local note. Okay, so we were in our suspend function. Now we have a special case. 
So as anyone who's implemented a room database knows, um, if you're going to be like using, uh, if you're not going to be returning live data objects, I believe is how it works, then you need to make calls to your room database, your, your DAO object, from the IO thread, from a background thread. You can't call it from the main thread, otherwise it'll throw an exception. So how do we jump to the IO context when we've got all of this nesting stuff going on? So again, we're still in a suspend function here. So we're, we have this nested kind of coroutines setup going. And then specifically when I want to jump threads at the end of this kind of event stream, we use dispatchers.io with, with context, which is a coroutine builder. And then we give it dispatchers.io, which is how we tell it to go to the main thread or the IO thread, excuse me. And then we actually can get the stuff out of the note, the, the DAO in this case is what we're talking to. We're asking our, our room DAO for a note by an ID. Okay, the end result, so we did all that stuff. So all of that happens in a synchronous style. So within our launch block here, we're, we're back at our root scope. We call this function and this thing could take 15 minutes. It's gonna wait for this function to complete. And then once it's done, it's sequentially going to move down to the next line. So understand this is where con coroutines can get confusing. Within a launch coroutine builder, and also within a suspending function. Both of these things operate synchronously by default, so they go line by line. They operate, they move synchronously, they move in direct, sorry, not synchronously, sequentially, forgive me. They operate sequentially line by line, but each line can be indeterminate and can be asynchronous. It can take 15 minutes to complete. It can take one minute to complete. Everything will just wait until that the nested coroutine finishes. Again, and obviously when I say it can wait 15 minutes, maybe your app will time out or something like that, but I'm just being uh, dramatic for effect here. So, um, I totally forgot where I was going with that particular point. Uh, so yeah, we just uh, understand this thing's going to work uh, sequentially. It's gonna sequentially move through these things. And once we're done our background operation, which returns a result, notice how this thing returns a result object. Then we just check and see what the result is. Was the result successful? Did some part of our nested coroutines set up throw an exception? If it did, our result wrapper is going to catch that and we can just check and deal with it then and there. So uh, this is, has been Ryan's long-winded 40 minute long explanation of coroutines. This is my first time uh, trying to really break down this whole topic and, and show you some really practical information. So I'm happy to hear feedback and uh, um, just to understand that over time I will polish this talk more and more and give better information but hopefully that was useful for everyone uh, like I say there's there's a lot of things you can get into with coroutines my personal preference especially for beginners is to use these launch blocks to bridge into asynchronous world the asynchronous world and then you can just call suspending functions in direct style or sequential style. And the result of that is we don't need callbacks anymore. We don't, no more staircase to hell, no more callback hell. That's pretty damn cool. Thank you for watching. I'm gonna run a quick commercial break and we'll get to some Q&A.
Okay, let's just move this back to normal distance. Oh, so, yeah, I'm bloody exhausted. So, uh, what's up, Al? Alright, so that was my long-ass explanation on coroutines, and I see we do not have any questions about that, which is totally fine. Uh, what I'm going to do is I've already talked for 45 minutes here, so um, I'm going to give about maybe two minutes, and if there's no questions after that, then I will call it a day, because I, I think that was enough rambling for today. But uh, yeah, like I say, hopefully that was useful for people. Um, one of the, I think one of the most important things with coroutines is, uh, in my case, you actually not only, okay, so one thing I will mention, um, I strongly suggest uh, Roman Elizarov's talks on Kotlin coroutines if you want some resources for them. Uh, Roman, cousin Roman, <laughs> there's one cousin Roman that I do want to go bowling with for an old uh, Grand Theft Auto joke. Anyways, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore it. But yeah, Roman Elizarov um, has some wonderful talks. Uh, he is, I believe he's like the team, uh, the lead on coroutines or something like that now. But he's actually a part of JetBrains. And he has some really wonderful talks about how to set up what coroutines are conceptually and how to set them up um, with the coroutine scope and things like that. Most of what I learned was either from Roman or by actually looking at the source code. And uh, there's a couple other people who do a decent job of it, but uh, I think Roman, in terms of really giving you the the a nice balance of practical and technical information, I, I think he's the best resource. So anyways, uh, no more questions. So I would just like to say uh, thank you so much for watching. Uh, as I say, hopefully that was useful for you. And uh, we'll see you in uh, another live stream Q&A. Thanks for watching and peace out. Oh, totally forgot to hit the uh, correct button there. Let's try that again. Peace out.